Um, ecosystems are different than value chains, and e ecosystems are different than muscled up value chains. So I think that we're paying, we're, uh, there's still a lot of people using a legacy um, concept of a value chain when, they, when, they re when they're talking about ecosystems, and I think we need to address that. I think mm -hmm. it's different. But what I think is different about ecosystems is the randomness of what happens and the mm -hmm. richness of the unintentional collisions, idea collisions. And I think this is really hard for a lot of people in the corporate world mm -hmm. to accept because it's their security that we're, we're, we're talking about. But my sense is non-centered ecosystems are really important. We haven't heard very much about that, um, about uh, equitable sharing of the uh, additional value created. I think that's important to talk mm -hmm. about. So th those are issues that I think are missing so far. And do you think it's, uh, um, because I see an evident, uh, 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 let's say, uh, um, look towards uh, China, no? for example. Do you see that uh, the cultural sh differences are really uh, promising in terms of uh, what can, came up from China and, 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 and these things that came up from China can be really accepted by Western management uh, community of which you are a, right. such a great... Uh, yeah, let's say representative. So we certainly did it with Japanese uh -huh. um, uh, manufacturing innovation. I don't see any reason why China would be different, except for the political climate at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, but what I'm more impre what I'm really impressed at is the, our Chinese colleagues who are talking to us in our own language. I mean, not not English, but talking to us in yeah. in, in by quoting Drucker, by yeah. you know, by by referring to models that come out of the West and. And, and enhancing them, and I think that that's quite a persuasive argument. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. So I would just ask you one question. Yeah. Right? It's more a reflection than a question. And uh, uh, given also the work you're doing, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what is your opinion in terms of, uh, um, you know, ecosystems have been uh, described as a, uh, change agents, let's mm -hmm. say, you know? or at least uh, uh, strategies that you, uh, platforms and ecosystems that you can uh, leverage to generate more change. No? That was one of the things that have been discussed. So my, my question for you is, uh, who's, who's, uh, the, who's setting the agenda of this change? Mm -hmm. you know, because uh, um, you know, sometimes it's like we, we give for granted that change is good. Oh, yeah. So yeah. my question is, what is the role of ecosystems and platforms uh, in uh, changing the, the change, reframing the change? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that everything always starts with the intention for the change, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, none of the tools that we have at our disposal for mindset shift in society or for social change in general make any sense unless we know what we're doing with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the metaphor or the idea, you know, of an ecosystem um, and, and the idea that by building an ecosystem you can drive change only makes sense if you know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and from this perspective, what I'm seeing from our work in Ashoka and um, both our own work in building ecosystems of support for change makers, but also from the work that change makers are, are, are you know, where they are intentionally building ecosystems is that, you know, there's no single problem in this world um, that anyone can solve on their own, mm -hmm. right? I think that's, that's a pretty established fact by now, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of the, you know, superhuman, you know, um, that will, that will you know, um, save us all um, is, is, is not, it's not happening. So we need to think of clever ways that we collaborate. And one way to collaborate is sort of a typical one-to-many relationship where, you know, you're the central node for everything that's happening, and that's not very efficient. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is you need to build many-to-many -many networks, and those typically become ecosystems because they be ideally they, they're, they're diverse, right? They're, you have diverse actors with diverse roles, some support, some take, some give, you know, and so... It's all about building social capital within these okay. in these ecosystems. I think that really is what you know creates power. So basically, it's like you know, rational capital is like an end instead of a mean. Yeah. No. I mean, you have to know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, you can you can create thousands of ecosystems, and some of them, you know, are for profit, and some people care about doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and other people build ecosystems because they want to uh, make the world a better place. Yeah. And uh, if I can add another quick question, uh, it's uh, what is uh, that you feel like it's uh, unspoken here at the Drake Forum? What is unspoken? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the unspoken things is that there's a lot of, you know, in the corporate world in general, I think there's a lot of very unhappy people. Uh -huh. Because, you know, corporate structures and dynamics typically, you know, take away autonomy, they take away the sense of self-efficacy, they take away creativity. And so what is unspoken, I think, is that a lot of people here are in search for meaning and purpose. Uh -huh. And I'm afraid they're not going to get it by staying where they are. Good point. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I agree with you. <laughs> I, I want to start with one reflection with you, no? that is, uh, uh, what, what is that is un uh, unspoken at the Dragon Forum? What is the, let's say, the... The elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if there's really like one uh, big element in the room, but what I there's something I miss, and I miss a little bit debate. Okay. Like there is um, obviously there's not there's much talk about. Uh, I'm actually not so sure if it's obvious, but there's much about talk about technology, a mm -hmm. lot of different uh, uh, terms. Like platforms, ecosystems, uh, sometimes AI, uh, mm -hmm. machine learning, um, all kind of terms that I'm slightly familiar with, but not def not necessarily know the definitions. Um, and I miss the talk about the human beings that are working in those organizations. And I I miss sometimes I hear it right. There are pockets of people um, like Joseph Block and uh, San Romine and. Uh, mm -hmm. Michele Zanini uh, and you obviously with uh, the Wu Young from uh, Hire and Bill mm -hmm. Fisher that there is really also talk about the human being and the entrepreneur or the, the people that need to that mm -hmm. need or the people that have another kind of uh, experience in, in, in like ecosystems or in platforms mm -hmm. um, but I was I'm always expecting that this should be the main theme of, uh, of, of a forum like especially a forum that is called the Peter Drucker Forum, that mm -hmm. the, the main topic would be the human. Um, so I miss that. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, I miss a little bit the uh, debate in diversity. Like, there's not many people discussing, many, or there's not people going in disagreement with others. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I feel, um, I feel uh, people are agreeing a lot with each other. And, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe that's fine. That's maybe their reflection of what I think. But I would love, love to see a little bit more action. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about yourself? No, I, I mean, I, I think that this question on diversity is, is interesting. And um, I, I, I think, you know, the question is that this, this conference, for me, is, is very much framed into this idea of strategy. No? Yes. That uh, it's not an idea that uh, um, comes out of thin air. comes essentially out of... Uh, cultural yeah. implications, uh, and one of which is uh, also uh, imperialism and colonialism and uh, uh, market meritocracy, which are essentially frames that we accept. Yeah. You know? So when we discuss about organizations and, and change and um, whatever, we, we, we discuss it in the frame of accepting, let's say, this uh, kind of basic language that we share, that is, we live in a Western society that is based on imperialism, and it's based on uh, uh, that kind of cultural norms, and, 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 and so my question now, I think, my, my interest now is, in a space like this, and also to, to make, probably to, to be at, at the uh, level of uh, the heritage of, of Peter Drucker, maybe we should uh, have more possibility to question the frame. Yeah. So not talk just about the organization, but talk about the frames that in frame the organization. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think about that? I'm not, I'm not completely sure uh, about what you mean with your question, but I, I would like to reflect a little bit on the diversity okay. and I would like to see I, how I understand what you just said. And um, I think I have a similar feeling in the sense that um, the, this, the speakers or the people that are 
that are, I think, in the room are, I think, all senior leaders mm -hmm. or somehow a uh, senior leader or maybe professors or mm -hmm. uh, consultants, maybe people that can actually um, are able to pay a certain amount of money to attend this forum or they are invited by others uh, like me. Um, and on the stage you see, I think, that view being... Um, or you see a reflection of what is sitting into in, in the room, right? The audience is a reflection of, I think, what is on the stage. Okay. So on the stage, there is like often leaders, CEOs, um, professors, established professors, um, um, or other told leaders, or people that call themselves told uh -huh. leaders, or maybe sponsors of the, the, the forum. And what I... Um, um, this diversity is for me not necessarily uh, um, uh, not male dominated or something. Right? I think there's fairly a lot of uh, women here on the stage, which I think is a great point. But I would also rather see some other, uh, maybe younger people, or maybe people that are not necessarily at the top of an organization, but more in the uh, in the bottom. Like if we want to start a revolution, and if we want to frame organizations differently, and if we want to organize ourselves beyond the hierarchy and the bureaucracy that's actually, I, I think, completely embodied by the place we are, this big palace. Okay. Um, I think we should also talk to the people that actually have to make that change in organizations, if we really want to do it. Mm -hmm. I feel here is still the notion that it has to come from leadership, or that mm -hmm. it has, uh, the leaders here um, are the ones that can change the ecosystems, or that can... And do, you need, do you think these leaders are, do you, they, you know, it's just a matter of inertia? That they need to bring forth to the same old thing, and they and they are living their identity crisis as well. Or do you think that they don't see the, the crisis yet? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so because if we look at the data, then we know only maybe a maximum of 10% of the people is engaged with the work they do. Mm -hmm. Like it's really passionate about what they are doing. Um, and I have nobody, nobody here spoke about it. Only Josse Block, I think he spoke about it, and he mm -hmm. made some pretty cool, com uh, I think, pretty nice comments about simplicity yeah. and about why, uh, questioning like why we need uh, HR or why we should need CFOs and that kind of things. And people laugh yeah. about it. You know, I think that's a, a, a reaction of of, a, of of an audience that actually don't believe that is possible. Mm -hmm. Which, while well, he is living it or he's showing it on big scale, it's possible. So if they are really ready to, to make that leap into, I would say, a new way of looking at the world, like not a new way, a different way, like uh, in, in a way of believing that the human is good mm -hmm. by nature, I'm not sure if these people here in the room are believing that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They don't talk about it, so I don't know. Uh, they rather talk about... Um, yesterday I, I heard uh, people... Uh, talking about uh, hitting uh, hitting people with a cricket bat, like uh, or bat, mm -hmm. as a, um, as a metaphor, obviously. But it sounded to me much more like the old uh, carrot and stick uh, uh, management philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, if they are really aware of what happens, I don't know. Or if they are really aware, like if you look at higher and the cases, I think uh, we we are familiar with. I think there's not many people in the room that truly understand how this new paradigm or mm -hmm. new way of organizing is actually really working in, in, mm -hmm. in, in reality. It's, it's interesting because it seems to me that Hire as is one of the companies that is breaking, and well, like Birdsorg, for example, mm -hmm. that is breaking one of the frames, which is the bureaucratic frame. You know, yeah, the or the higher control. Frame, yeah. uh, and, 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 but beyond these frames, Hire itself, for example, is very much focused on this idea of customer experiences. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yes, the Miriam that I want to also uh, interview, hopefully, uh, she said she made this point of, uh, um, you know, don't just give me solutions, but give me problems to engage yeah. with, you know, yeah. uh, which is still far from also the higher points of view. You know? So higher somehow is a traditional in terms of uh, the frame of technology and modernity and smart home that yeah, uh, yeah, is, yeah. Pro is promoting, you know. 
So, which is quite different from what Miriam said. You know, it's, uh, you know, let's build organizations so that we can engage with problems. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so those are the frames that are really. And you, you for example, you spoke about the frame of uh, uh, gender, uh, well, not much gender, but ge uh, generation, yeah, uh, diversity. diversity uh, north and south, I believe, is also an issue. You know, there's not much uh, south of the world here. You, um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Like cultural, yeah, more culture, cultural yeah, diversity. Yeah, 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 and uh, 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 I would say also class. class that's something yeah. that you brought up. Yeah. You know, class diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow. Um, so we have elites on, on stage most of the times. I think still this is very much a. Uh, um, Elitist. Yeah. Yeah. Bit. yeah. Yeah, no, not a little bit, I think, because you need a fairly amount of money and time to, spend, yeah, to come course, here. Of and, course. Um, and this, I think this has, uh, this is also partly tradition, I think, this comes from history. Um, but I think it needs to change. Or, or, let's say it differently, I'm not sure if this is the, the, the stage that is making the change mm -hmm. possible that we are looking mm -hmm. for. Or that we are aiming for. I have a question for you and then I'll let you go. Um, you guys are corporate uh, rebels, no? So the, uh, We call ourselves. Like yes. The, and uh, I mean, the name, you know? The, the, yeah. so, so somehow the name itself is a framing, you know, because you're talking about corporates. Yeah. So my question for you is uh, what, do you, what is your, your, your vision, your intuition, let's say, mm -hmm. for uh, this. Uh, beast that is uh, organizing you know so what do you see as a new possible directions in, way in, in, in which organizing is going to develop yeah behind beyond corporates maybe you know? yeah, yeah. Um, first of all we the the name corporate rebels is gaining a, a little bit too much uh, uh -huh. um, or it frames us in a certain direction mm -hmm. that we are not not necessarily only looking at corporates, okay. but it, we we when like when we started four years ago, we we came up with a name and it sounded quite uh, accurate what we wanted to okay. achieve. Like uh, a corporate and the rebels are like uh, like two two things that you don't necessarily um, believe they can go, go mm -hmm. together. Um, and I I would say like higher would be a, a true corporate that mm -hmm. does Definitely. things differently. But one of our biggest inspirations inspiration is Jossen Block, and obviously this is a non-profit, uh, non so it has nothing to do with the corporate. Um, our own organization, Corporate Rebels, we have been um, uh, growing over the last year, still around 10 people. Um, we are not, obviously not a corporate, but we are uh, for-profit. Mm -hmm. But I rather believe in the, more of a networked kind of uh, environment where uh -huh. um, Everyone um, shares the authority based on much more natural uh, uh, leadership skills and uh, and um, the amount of impact and um, added value or the value you add to the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I very much uh, believe in a lot of transparency and a lot of distributed authority and mm -hmm. freedom and trust on people. Um, so that is why I wish the world is. Is move, or we are fighting actually to move the world much more from an old, old ideas that you need to control people and that you need to have rules in place and that you need to uh, have hierarchy and and, uh, and necessarily always focus on profits. We profit. We much more think that you should focus on a, on an added value for the world and and, and mm -hmm. for yourself. Maybe you can obviously earn money with that. That's fine. Um, but treat anybody in the organization as an adult, not as a not as a kid, uh, and distribute authority and be radical transparent mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what you do. So there is a certain uh, that's a certain belief system we much more believe in. And actually, I believe that you will be in, in business wise much more successful if you are much more in this uh, a progressive way of mm -hmm. uh, thinking. And then in turn, like what I my particular interest is in how you would organize that internally. And I, I believe that that is mostly done with small teams mm -hmm. um, and, and breaking up the large corporates in smaller t in networks of smaller teams, which look like like any other uh, network, like uh, Metro or like uh, or telephone and stuff, 
where you have like nodes and, and, link, and links that connect the nodes uh, with a small leadership team that still mm -hmm. decides about direction and about uh, guarding or the architects. We heard that a couple of times, the architect of the, 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 the network. Um, but the nodes being small teams where people know each, still know each other, where people hire their own people, where they fire their own people, mm -hmm. and where they share the, the value they create, or that would, that's what hire would say, like where mm -hmm. they share the profit they make, or if they if they make a lose, they share that as well, right? So they yeah. have to... Yeah, very entrepreneur, yeah. Yeah, very entrepreneur. Um, that's what you also see at the Block and Burtzog. These nurses in the teams are very entrepreneurial people. Mm -hmm. It's not a corporate, but, the, but... Is there any, do you think, any political uh, dimension of this conversation? Like, either in, in, the, company, well, in the companies, in the, in the systems that you're dealing with, like Bullsock, for example, yeah. um, or do you think it's more a conversation we are having on, on the uh, techniques of organizing, of the um, shape of the institution, but still in the, without touching too much the political questions which are... Uh, hide hidden behind, behind our concept of the organization. Oh, it's a it's a difficult question uh, because I, I'm not really too much familiar with the, like I mean, I'm, in I'm an engineer. Of, but, yeah, but me say, too. But, me too. But what what I what in I, terms of, I mean the critique of capitalism itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I also yeah. There is a big part part of that as well. I think mm -hmm. that the. Um, um, Capitalism, in, in in the sense that just earning money for shareholders, that this mm. is by definition, I think, something you don't see in this progressive organizing organizations that I study. You don't see that happen. Actually, the people that are part of the organizations are also often the part of the shareholders. Mm -hmm. So they they have their own good, but they also have really strong links with the local community. So mm -hmm. um, they do good for themselves, for the community, and for the like where the world they are part of. Um, but I believe that um, you can change this by changing the structure, by mm -hmm. changing the structure of organizations and having people be bear the responsibility of their local team, because these local teams are in the local community. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's many people that want to um, pollute their own backyard. Right? Mm -hmm. we, we can easily think about polluting uh, far away terrains that mm -hmm. you never see the consequences. Discounting, yeah. Exactly, but if you, take it, uh, if you take it um, to your own backyard, people start to act way more responsible. So somehow the, the design of the organization can be a bridge, you know, to bring this, uh, to bring uh, the critique into other fields, like political yeah. field and the yeah, and, 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 yeah. and we should also not be ignorant about technology. For exactly. example, I think we should uh, 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 bridge the two, like and say, okay, you have to be local, or you have a local team, but you're also obviously by technology you're connected to all the other teams yeah, that are yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the. I totally agree on that. And, and that's what Birdsock is doing. That's why they scale so fast. Mm -hmm. Like they have small teams, if you, but Birdsock itself never set up a big organization. Doesn't set up new teams. They wait till four nurses come, uh, because what what that implies is that one of the nurses is a natural leader, because he or she has convinced three others to join. They hook them up to the IT system. They have everything in place. They have to run their neighborhood. If they are not on a certain uh, productivity level in, let's say, one year, there will be serious uh, conversations if this team can uh, mm -hmm. keep continuing doing the being part of the network. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting. So there, 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 there's a big part community in there, uh, very much a lot of collaboration, but there's also some part of competition and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. being efficient. Yeah. And so now uh, I believe also that the, the way that uh, Jos, um, uh, sorry, sorry, the Jos, guy, Jos, Jos, um, uh, spoke about the technology. Yeah. Uh, in a, as a as a tool to remove bureaucracy, basically transform yeah. bureaucracy into technology. It's very interesting because. Bureaucracy somehow is the expression of the uh, mm, relationship between capital and labor. Yeah. So it's there because only through bureaucracy you can extract value from labor. You know? mm. So that, that's part of Marx's uh, critique. Okay. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we have now the technology and uh, the, the, this capacity to use technology intentionally to reduce bureaucracy, for example, to eliminate bureaucracy, yeah. it sounds really like... Uh, a way to try to reframe the relationship we have with technology. 
Yeah. You know, so not a technology to uh, dominate, but a technology to liberate. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. I found it really, really uh, inspiring. I, and to, to liberate and to enable people to to do what they can do best. Yes. So to let their skills or let their time be free to do like yes. their their, ma their mastery. Or and I don't think it's a case that Burzog is an organization which is involved in care, because care is really, really the core of this. Uh, uh, you know, Bernard Stiegler, for example, has this way of framing the Neganthropocene, mm -hmm. which is the, the you know the, a way to overcome modernity, let's say, as very much rooted in care, the idea of care. So Stiegler sees the future of society as a society that is able to overcome modernity as a society based on care. Mm -hmm. So I think Burzorg is really, really at this forefront. It's a very interesting organization that people yeah. should uh, study more. Yeah, if I think it will. Uh, um I heard, or I spoke with Jules uh, just a few minutes ago when uh -huh. we were recording the other uh, interview, and he also said that there are lots of uh, a lot of interest from people, yeah. like uh, after the talk, and also by the I would say uh, more legacy institutions yeah. like Harvard, and uh, putting a lot of interest in in, in their model, um, and hopefully the, this kind of uh, institutions will uh, uh, get the right message, right, the, yeah. the, the right the right story. Because, for example, the, I'm, I'm very much interested in the practical part of that and how, for example, if you have this IT, IT, IT development, like how did it go? And the, uh, so um, I, I once asked that and, and he told me that, uh, or one of the nurses, he told me that uh, at the beginning of uh, Birchok there was like an IT company where I think the, the, the programmers or the developers spent one year with uh, nurses on the road uh -huh. just to see like how they could optimize the the IT exactly. system to extract all the bureaucracy and all these elements out of their hands into the IT system mm -hmm. and, um, and and I think that kind of worked um, but it, it shows that they had to invest like so much time into uh, design the perfect tool for that uh, particular organization and now still they have some what they call necessary bureaucracy it's still because they deal with the government right they need to get yeah. Uh, deal with the insurance uh, companies and they have to deal with the yeah. government uh, and with legal issues and with uh, HR issues so they still have like around 50 people in the headquarters mm -hmm. dealing with the, like what they call the necessary yeah, for, for, for half a billion companies not yeah, that it's bad. crazy it's, uh, <laughs> so that's why their overhead is like 8% uh, instead yeah. of 30% yeah. um, no but it's a very highly inspiring company I think it's changing it, it is changing healthcare um, it's this part of care, I think you're really right, and I think what what could also very much work, I think, would be in, in education, for example. Mm -hmm. In education, we could also go back, I think, <laughs> to have um, um, schools being very locally connected with um, with with teachers running their own school. Yeah, well, that's a little bit of the idea of Zach Stein. I don't know if you know his no. work. Has written this book called Education in Between Worlds. Yeah. Uh, in a time between worlds, and uh, yes, this idea that education needs to become uh, the economy needs to be in service of education instead of yeah. the other way around. Education in service of the economy, which is more or less what we have now. No, An education that provides the economy with players that play along the rules, yeah. while instead it should be the education that we invent, the, the economy that we invent to support continuous learning and education. Yeah, and, and, so and, that's and, it. and if you would, if I, if I think about it in organizations, this is, I think, what all the um, service, like departments, like HR and finance, yeah. should do for the for the front line, and that's how they do that in in in, in Bruxelles. They say uh, coaches and HR and finance experts are in service, as for, front service line. for the front line. Well, in, in traditional bureaucracy, they are in charge. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. so the, the people that that have the business model, run the business model run the business model so that the bureaucracy can continue to exist more or Be less because of them <laughs> but do, do you, are you familiar with the, the Swedish bank called Handelsbank no like I think that that shows that structure can change a lot of like this kind of dynamics like Handelsbank is a Swedish bank it's one of the most successful bank in uh, North Europe mm -hmm. um, they are not only in Sweden they are in Scandinavia and England and in, in England and Holland they are the, the fastest growing um, Mm -hmm. bank at the moment and they have small teams that are located into the uh, like small branches located in local communities mm -hmm. uh, and they can make 
they're like the banks, the bankers in the bank and the local bank can have a lot of authority, so they can make a lot of decisions themselves. And what they have a saying like, um, uh, all your customers must see the same uh, uh, church tower. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. cannot have any customer that doesn't see your same church tower, right? Mm -hmm. So you, that means that the, the bankers very much know all the, the, the clients they have. Uh -huh. Uh, which enable them to have only three layers in the hierarchy. So there's uh, 14,000 people in the bank, but they have like the branch level, then they have like some kind of regional level and uh, headquarters. Uh, very lean uh, bank okay. compared with other banks. But they also show that they have a, a very safe banking because they don't they know in which people to invest and which not mm -hmm. uh, because they have a like a relational uh, um, or they have like some kind of uh, how can I say that. They don't have a relation with them already. They have lots of other people. <laughs> some new water, yeah. some new coffee. Um, then they can ask some other people in the community, "What do you, can you introduce me to that person?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and that, so this model of, of birds or this model of having small things being rooted in in in, uh, community. in community, but being connected by uh, technology. We see this in hire. We see this. Uh, in a bank or higher in production, we see this in the bank in uh, north of, uh, of Europe, mm -hmm. you see it in healthcare. So there's many, there, in Bilbao there's a really cool uh, group of communities uh, mm -hmm. of around 10,000 people being mostly in manufacturing, like in steel companies, uh, helping each other out if one company is, is in, uh, in problems, uh, the NER group they're called. Um, but I see, we see it happening it's actually. It's an emerging part then, I mean. I hope so, but this is the, I hope it is, uh, I have one hope, um, uh, I will tell you why I have that hope, but the, the, what, what is the um, kind of a, an idea I have is like, if you are in this world, right, and if you are studying this world and you read all the stories about it, I feel everybody's talking about it, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that is because it's really changing or if that's, I'm just head first in this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this, community and I'm reinforcing by social media and by my phone and yeah, my bubble and I only see my own stories. But uh, a few months ago I, we visited uh, D. Hock, I don't know you know mm -hmm. D. Hock of Visa uh, or the, the, the founder of Visa yeah. in uh, Seattle. And that guy has great ideas already since the 70s and 80s. If you read his, his work it's all about yeah. the, the, the things we talk about nowadays. Um, if, if you look into Visa, it, it's also in the former Visa, let's say this way, it's I think, yeah. an amazing way of organizing. Um, and he, he told me, like, I asked him the same question, like, do you think it's changing? Because he's a little bit more on age, so I could ask yeah. him, like, do you think it's changing? And he said, yeah, it's really changing. Like, the, back in the days, I would not get much attention. Nowadays, I get, like, uh, invitations every day for a couple of people. So yeah. it, it is... It looks Lonely. like it's, the tide is changing a little bit. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, and, I, and fair enough, right? We should be, we should get a little. I, I guess it will also depend on how, how courageous we are in this process and to really get over our existing identities, uh, which are grounded in these frames that we spoke about. You know, these yeah. uh, political and economic frames. And, uh, yeah, and of, like for us, it's not like, a, or I don't know for you, but. But for me, I didn't have many much to lose. Like I was only two years in my uh, traditional career, so uh -huh. I was not. I didn't invest lots of time and effort in a, in a certain status yeah. or. Uh, maybe that's the generational gap that we are living, no? Because some people that maybe have more are more invested, you know, in a, in a system that is just continuing by inertia, but. Uh, well, yeah, but they, they should not be afraid because there's a perfect place for them as well. Like uh, there is not that they. We, we get rid of this uh, mm -hmm. of a generation. I think of there's. Course. I think many. What we see in, in real, reality is when a, a, a company really transforms from from let's say more traditional to progressive. It's that the older generation is actually much more happy with that transformation because they can finally do. Mm -hmm. Like they don't lose like much. They maybe lose some status symbols or whatever, but they can finally do what they wish to do. It's just like add value to the organization. I mean, at the end, you can find some meaning finally. Yeah, yeah, and everybody, <laughs> everybody wants freedom and meaning yeah. and autonomy uh, and some like mastery, you know, some yeah. uh, using your talents. So, yeah, we all like that. And we are we are not different than Definitely. our father's generation. Our mother's well, we are we are just uh, expecting continuations of that, that work. So somehow we are all connected in that. Thanks very much.
You're welcome. So uh, the, the question that I, I, I have for you is twofold. One, one, the first one is if you can expand a little bit more on this uh, uh, idea that GAFAs are not the example because these uh, ecosystems and platform uh, transformation is more widespread and it's really, really pervasive. Mm -hmm. you know, since you have been studying this for quite a lot, so if you can expand a little bit on that uh, and explaining in what ways it's going to be pervasive. Yeah. And so let me start by speaking a little bit about my comment on using the wrong analogies. And I think that one of the concerns that I have is that people are looking a little too much to the GAFA. Why is this a problem, you would say? Well, it is a problem because uh, the GAFA have got some attributes that are rather atypical. People speak about network externalities, and I think that this is um, often quite overdone. What are network externalities? Well, the direct and indirect network externalities. Mm -hmm. Direct network externalities is when I derive pleasure by the fact that you also consume the same thing. Uh, if I have a telephone, I need someone else to have a telephone because if I have a phone, or to make it more straightforward, if I have a fax machine, if I'm the only owner of a fax machine, I'm a rather sad individual. Mm -hmm. If everyone has fax, the value of my fax goes up. This is a direct network effect. It is a demand side network effect. The other one is a supply network effect. I want to go where people go who can provide me stuff. I don't want to go to a market that has lame sellers. I want to go to a market that has all the good sellers. Do I get value from the fact that the people are in the same market? Probably not. Let's think about GAFA. GAFA are cases where they have both direct and indirect network externalities. Do I care about who else is on the same social media platform? You bet, because otherwise I know what my friends do. On the other hand, I also want a place that can have all the other complementary goods and services, all the kinds of things that I need. Now let's go back and then say, is this something that is relevant for all markets? Not quite. Think about Uber. Uber is a market that has indirect network externalities. I do want to go where all the drivers go because I want to find a car. Mm -hmm. Do I really care about going somewhere where the other customers go? No, actually I hate it because mm -hmm. I'm going to be paying surge pricing. I don't like the fact that others are using the same thing at the same time that I'm doing. So the thing is that the more people go to Uber in terms of demand, the less they may end up liking it. Why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because people think that once you get size, you just got it. Mm -hmm. Size begets profits. Why? Because once you get really big, people are entirely locked in. This happens with things like social media that have both direct and indirect network effects, but it does not happen in a number of other uh, simpler ecosystems that have to do with production. So when people think about ecosystem, they should ask themselves, is there a benefit of other people being in the same ecosystem, or is it just that they want to get their job done? And I think that that drives a very different market conditions, very different strategies, very different profitability profiles. It means that you should not have the same amount of tolerances of early losses, um, because you can become mythically rich once you get market share. So I think that generally we have a fairly unsophisticated understanding about the strategic dynamics of um, platforms and ecosystems. That's problem number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing that you asked me about has to do with the geopolitics. And I think in the geopolitics, <laughs> the problem is that you have uh, politicians who are used to take trade wars, or perhaps to the idea of trade wars when you, ha you take Trump, who apparently is just used to pushing people around and thinks that being tough works, that unfortunately may start backfiring. I think that a good example of that has to do with what is happening now with the pushback of the U.S. administration against Huawei. Think about the structure that happened in the mobile phone market. What you used to have is that uh, if you had um, Huawei, together with many other uh, product producers of mobile phones, um, that were relying on Android, that was the operating uh, system and uh, the area that was uh, allowing you to buy stuff. It's called GMS, as <coughs> a Google Mobile Services. Private to Google, by the way, not the open source little kernel that sits underneath called ASOP, the Android uh, Open Software Project. Um, uh, and um, Huawei was very happy to tag that along. It did phones, it made money of its phones, it didn't need to think about apps, it didn't need to think about operating systems. 
Google was happy because it would keep its dominance in operating systems. By trying to push Huawei away, essentially, it, it told Huawei that your phone is going to be unusable without it. What does that mean? It means that something that was an American global dominance is going to be fragmented because the Chinese have no chance. I mean, it'd be stupid not to create something else. Why? Well, because the American president says, can say, at any one point, I can just make you blow up, and I'm going to give you 90 days, and you will nearly blow up, and then I'm going to defuse it. It's like these old movies that we had with the heroes, the heroes cutting the fuse just before the bomb, the bomb explodes. After a mm. while, you're like, forget it, mate. I'm going to do one of my own. And that's exactly what the Chinese are going to do, one of their own. Now, Google is freaking out and saying, you idiots. You're going to stop the thing that allows us to be so profitable. But unfortunately, the Trump administration thinks that it's right and it is leading to a bifurcation. Uh, we are seeing right now something that is straining the development in the world and it will create technologies where there is going to be competition between the East and the West. Is this good news because the West will continue its dominance? I don't think so. It just is going to hasten the ability of China to focus on areas that it didn't think that it needed focusing. And I think that if you look at the dynamics, um, that will probably be bad news for the United States, possibly for Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. I have to go. <laughs>